Um, hello, I'm uh, Tom Mansfield. I'm from Plymouth Marine Laboratory, which is a multidisciplinary marine research centre down in Plymouth in Devon. I'm sure many of you, many of you know about it. But uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, kind of one very bounded piece of work, but uh, it's just coming to a conclusion. Um, and effectively, we've had something like five months to uh, to take uh, take some some NERC funding that's funded by the the Constructing Digital Environments to to see what we can do to try and make make data more fair. So the data from the Western Channel Observatory to increase the the fairness of it, so that we're well positioned when new technologies come along, when autonomy comes along, to increase the increase the resolution of the data, both temporal and space. Sorry, it's all right. You're in the right place. It's just like <laughs> Um, so what can we do? What can we do to, to improve the fairness of data, to make it more machine and profitable, to make it scale better, to make it more findable uh, as we go to somewhere where testing isn't weekly, it becomes constant, continuous with, with multiple sensors. Uh, and so it's about the project uh, throughout this presentation, sorry. I'm give you a very quick overview of the motivation. That's a bit more about what the WCO is. Why? Why do we care about fair now? Uh, talk through the method of how we've gone about thinking about the aspects of it. Uh, the method is very, very closely linked to the fact we've taken quite an agile approach to actually developing things and iterating around quite fast, kind of building on some of the things we had in the workshop yesterday with uh, the Carl's workshop on design sprints. We've kind of taken that, that philosophy of uh, pulling together um, kind of a, not just PML, but also we have partners in this project from, from, uh, from NOC and from VODC, uh, NOC in VODC. Uh, who uh, helped us in those sprints to, to work out what we're doing. Uh, and then a quick overview of the key outputs. So at the end of this bit of, fun this bit of funding, what we learned, where can you go to find more, what resources are there made of the A reasonable amount to go through, also lots of colors. So, uh, so apologies for the past, apologies for nine, if I wave my hand around. But um, so in Western Channel Observatory, just as a recap, in Plymouth, or just off the coast of Plymouth, um, and effectively, it's, it's lots of boys, lots of uh, lots. There's a few atmospheric stations. We have boats going out from uh, from PML, also from the Marine Biological <laughs> Association, for an almost co-located with us in Plymouth, uh, and taking measurements of uh, taking measurements as the be able to see. I think the title was from from photons to fish. It's really everything everything in between. Um, and uh, this, uh, I think, as I've also mentioned by Matthew Palmer. Uh, in the presentation, my colleague from Peter earlier today, that this site had some data sets running since 1903. So there's a, a really, a very really long time series of data covering really a lot of parameters. Uh, and so we're at the point now where currently that data tends to have been collected by humans on something like a weekly basis. There are automated boys, but a lot of it is every week a boat goes out, there are nuts and nets, there are buckets of water, there are people taking samples, uh, and there are humans putting the data into databases, writing metadata in blog books, and then copying it into uh, copying it into various places of the metadata survives. Um, we have a lot of work at PML and in other places. Matthew also mentioned the National Centre for Coastal Autonomy yesterday to look at increasing increasing autonomy, so increasing the number of platforms, the number of sensors. We start to increase the, the kind of the persistence of the sensors. We start to increase the number of them. So we effectively there's a wave of data coming towards us, uh, and hopefully before that wave of data really comes, we can do something to make the data more fair. Um, that's on the supply side, if you like. On the demand side, there's also a lot of uh, requirements for these big data sets with, um, with machine learning, with artificial intelligence, with uh, lots of smart things we can do that will benefit from the, uh, the higher resolution data, but only if we can make it machine interoperable, if we can make it fair, if we can make it really easy. Uh, and so that effectively links into the, the aims of uh, the aims and objectives of this very bounded piece of work and see what we can do in a in a reasonably short space of time. Uh, the main project aim is to use fair data principles to maximize the impact of this uh, kind of high resolution data. And it broke down into two objectives. One is to make the data more findable to allow people to explore it a bit better, uh, data and metadata visualization. Um, and the second part of the, the second part of the objective is to effectively improve the data access. So once someone's found the data, once they're interested in it, how do they know where to go to get the data? How do we give them the best version. How do we give point them in the direction of the uh, kind of the persistent, persistent places for the data when you can have near real time data compared with things from hundred years ago? It's kind of it's it's quite different data 
Uh, so how do we structure it so that it's, it's really simple to step through and get the data from the right place with the right provenance, with the right ownership, licensing. And... Okay, so uh, as I say, this is kind of where the slides start to get slightly more colorful. Uh, so again, this, this project started with a very strong focus on um, who's using the data and why are they using the data, which is why I mentioned the uh, kind of uh, design sprint philosophy we had last time. We've had a couple of workshops with our partners in the research community. Also, we've kind of pulled in any other stakeholders that we can get our hands on to try to understand who's using the data. And we focus on two main areas. One is for data contributors, so effectively mitigating the barriers for uh, the use of community standard metadata throughout the pipeline. So this is effectively the, the scientist on the boat who is taking the recordings. We want to remove all the barriers. So rather than writing the metadata down or log book using their own terms, using something else that they actually start to use by default things from the NERC vocabulary server, if we can if we can get there at all. So right at the start of the data pipeline, we're starting to use standard, standard terminology, standard metadata. Uh, in addition, the other area we're focusing on quite a lot is that data users which is uh, encouraging data users to effectively access the data from the correct place and to understand the, how to how to cite it, uh, kind of how to reference it, where 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 to go get it again in five years time if they want to repeat the uh, if they want to go repeat the same piece of work. So they're kind of two of the main areas we looked at to get that far. We had lots of lots of stick people. Uh, just a quick recap of their principles because they, they come up quite a lot in this presentation, but effectively. We're looking at making it so fair a lot, and I can explain that it's fine and accessible and top and reusable. Hopefully, it's a reasonably safe audience for people that fair reasonably well, and uh, never, never have to be reminded. And throughout this presentation, we're using the kind of the go fair, the go fair principles uh, of what that makes, which I think is kind of the community standard. Uh, and so, we have the first glimpse of some of the tools we've actually made, of which is a video, which I'm excited about. Um, but effectively, this is a website, it's currently that's an improvement of the current WCO website. Um, and it's currently sitting on our development server, but it's due to go live before the end of this month. So it's, it's coming soon. Uh, and uh, I say, the, the idea of the video is just to prove that there's a, there's a real thing, I promise. Um, and effectively, one of the things we've done is start to improve the tools so that people can start to dig into these really big data sets. You've got, I don't know, kind of many, many decades of data. Uh, and we try to provide some tools so that you can actually kind of at a high level, dig into what that data is, go look at certain data, look at the parameters that are available, look for interesting features and be able to uh, be able to understand what's there. And this is a really nice piece of functionality, but as we see kind of through these slides, you have a kind of fair, fair bingo, I think is the, the best name for it, where against the fair principles, it doesn't actually get you anything, but it's a, it's kind of a really useful first set of kind of free tests and things. Uh, and as we go through the other features, the idea is with this, then we can show how they link to the pair, how the themes we've developed link to the pair principles as we do. Uh, so next one, so a very vital thing is the uh, kind of um, the increase in the quality of the, the usage metadata, if you like. So throughout all the tools, you now, all the tools shine a very clear light on uh, what metadata is there. That for instance, in the tool tips, when you look at link over something, it links to the, the kind of the metadata terminology from the, the, the standardized community standard vocabulary service. And if there is a different metadata word, so if someone's, I don't know, called it water temperature and they misspelled the water, so it's something very similar to water temperature, then that will come up in addition, but then there'll be an empty space about the term that we probably should be using. Uh, and the idea is that as the data goes in automatically, it prompts, prompts scientists to go use the standard terms. If they want to use a different one, they can do, but it kind of raises the question of why, why not use the standard terms earlier? Uh, and so, bingo. Uh, that starts to get us quite a lot of points towards the kind of the findableness uh, and the interoperability as well. It's kind of um, using some tools and some visualizations to try to encourage the use of standard metadata. Uh, similar story with the discovery metadata as well, where at the top, we have the discovery metadata is always visualized when we're looking at the data. You have the option of taking it off with a little radio button. But by default, it's always there. And if there are missing metadata fields, then there's an empty space. Again, yeah, as a as a way that the community data users, that everybody in PML outside of PML can see the quality of the metadata, discovery metadata at a glance. So if there's things missing, maybe that's fine. Maybe it's a problem to go to go fill something in. Which again, 
it's a similar set of uh, kind of fair, fair themes uh, that we have in the usage model. Uh, interestingly, from the plot so far, the background has always been green. We now have one with a red background, which is in the tools. We now have kind of an automated quality checking. So it's a reasonably simple quality checking at the moment, but as the data comes in, so the near real time data comes in, we check it against the kind of some scientists kind of, um, kind of derived upper limits, lower limits, and kind of a, a variation test, a variance test, just to make sure the sensor's still alive. But we at least have the ability that if we get some data that we that could have some errors in it, then it gets tagged. Well, it gets first of all visualized on a red background. The title has data as failed validation tests, um, and we are in the process of then adding adding a field into the metadata to show that this is failed uh, failed validation tests. So on the, it helps on the reusable bit. It kind of has not quite colored in blocks because effectively we have the framework to do the error checking. We have the framework to to kind of uh, understand there is something that's simple, but we'd like to add a lot more complexity to this. It's kind of perhaps a, perhaps a piece of future work, but at least we have the, the functional block to be able to put error checking into the WCA data uh, and this automated error checking. Uh, similarly, we have the ability to handle missing data as well. So if there's missing data, this is the most boring slide I've ever presented because it shows something missing, but uh, hopefully the missing data is there. You still end up with the uh, discovery metadata if, uh, if there is still metadata. Um, and it kind of it falls over in a graceful way, and we can show we can show it to the citizens again. Helps us with accessibility. Um, interestingly, in addition to the automated data checking, we also have a very human data checking. Where on all the screenshots, you see the little smiley faces in the bottom, in the bottom right hand side, uh, which is as people are uh, as people are using the data, as the community are using it, members of the public are using it, scientists are using it. If there's something good or not so good in the data and now the ability to very quickly hit, hit the smiley face of I like it nah, or I don't like it uh, and leave a little note of I don't like it because and the idea here was that it's super lightweight there's hardly any burden hopefully someone will fill this in before they just hit x and go somewhere else to look for data and we start to be able to collect some data some ideas about how we think we are now using community standards, we think we're using uh, kind of useful, useful features, user-friendly tools, and we start to find out, is that really true? Uh, so we start moving forward. So again, it helps us not too much, but start to come to the, the, the kind of reusable data of ensuring that we're using data standards. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a reasonably important one, I think, of accessing the data. So we've had a lot of metadata so far. What's happening in this video is that we get the composite blocks, which have lots of years with the data. Uh, and effectively, you can hit download the data. It takes you to this page, which is the um, wall who's using the data to so use that in the future. You can hit submit. And what you'll see in a second is that the, we have a kind of a, a request handling service in the background that if you're looking at data from I don't know, 2015 to today, the data that the idea is that the newest data goes into kind of a staging area in PML where it might change, there might be some error corrections, there might be some kind of, some things happen to it. Uh, once it's passed the quality checks, it goes to our partners in BODC. So what's happened here is you just looked at the date range, you don't know where the data is, you hit submit, uh, and you can see that it, in the background, the service goes, gets the data from BODC, where there's data from BODC. Also, if there's a piece of data that's in PML that isn't the BODC, that gets put in the WCO code. So it's completely transparent to the user. They just look at the data they're interested in. They say, I want that data. And it gets it from the best place. With, if that's BODC, where it's had extra quality checks, where there's a really persistent identifier, where it's really not going to change, that's the best place to get it. If the record, if the record was recorded yesterday and it's in WCO, then, um, then, uh, then it comes from there. Because that's the so again, yes, there's lots of accessible in the bare language. Uh, so if I stick to a couple, because I had a team one a second ago, very quickly, we've also clarified licensing, how you can use the data as kind of in your face, as, as clear and as concise as we can make it, um, which helps. And so, we have lots of colors. A very important part is that the way that we collect metadata from the scientists, because that's the thing that drives all of it, is Excel. So we made it super low tech barrier, not scary, not terrifying. It's Excel. We try to do something smart in the background where the Excel leads to things in the no vocabulary server. So by default, it's to use standard stuff, but it shouldn't scare any, anybody 
if you're a super, super expert in the sampling water with the bucket, then hopefully this is the, the minimum kind of uh, simple interface that we can have to, to extract the metadata from the Absolutely. Usability is a massive thing for the interoperability to nudge right at the start. Uh, scientists to give you the quick metadata. So, the conclusions we have lots of fair things. There's a couple of things that aren't covered, particularly around the findableness, uh, which we're working with our partners at the ADC. So, when you download the data, we'll also get a persistent identifier in the metadata, we hope, in the near future. We've in the sections. We've gone a long way in the fair bingo, as uh, we've got not quite a house, but almost a house. And this is my final slide. This is a, a lot of colors we can get through. But some of the key project outputs. One is we have an improved, we have an improved website to update the users. Second output is we have an improved interface that encourages scientists to uh, in fact, we use the correct terminology, standardize their data, which also gets them a lot of benefits because then hopefully they could use a single analysis tool among multiple projects, among multiple teams, because data is in the same format, has the same headers, you can just use the same, same Python scripts to process it and other things. So there's a lot of benefits there. Um, we have also throughout it collected impact data. So when you request the data in the background, it notifies us in PML as to who's using the data, what we're using for, and we have the GDPR elements so we can we can get in touch with you and uh and sit on the and find out how you've used it. Uh so a couple of useful things for the community. One is there's a record of this implementation in the post, it will be there by the end of the month. And uh, interestingly, also there's a reference architecture which is now available, um, which gives a kind of an overview of the approach we've taken, the design decisions that we've made, the architectures have a work in the back in a way that is hopefully completely reusable. So if anybody's doing anything similar, this is a good place to go look, to steal our ideas, reuse our ideas, improve our ideas. Please feel free to let us know any improvements. And, uh, and hopefully this is a useful resource for the community. Thank you very much. Um, quick question, it's kind of a hybrid question. So did you, did you look at different metadata schemas for the uh, elements? And also did you, have you had to implement specific like time series schemas to allow the graphs to work automatically? Uh, not too bad, to be honest. We've um, so I say we've done this in collaboration with partners at DODC, um, James Ayliff in particular. And um, so yeah, for the discovery metadata, we use the MEDIN metadata discovery standard. For the usage metadata, then uh, I forget now. It's the effectively C data net derived stuff. So no, we, we I, I think we haven't made anything. Uh, I think we link to those things. The link is in the simple looking in Excel interface. Uh, and that's where it, in the background, prompts you to the service for the correct metadata terminology for the schemas. Uh, and once we have those, then it's reasonably easy to go Thanks very much. Well, thank you.